Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Matthew Pullen. Uh, I'm SVP here at LSX and one of the directors of the Healthspan show. Uh, I'm just continuing to uh, admit uh, some additional people into the roundtable, but we're going to get started. I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, interactive roundtable uh, this afternoon. Uh, today's session is looking at personalised nutrition models uh, and their implications for population health span. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel of contributors uh, and I'll shortly be handing over to our moderator for today. Uh, we are in for a fascinating discussion, I'm sure. Uh, it is worth mentioning that this session is interactive uh, and I really would encourage you to get involved in the session as much as possible. We're obviously in a Zoom meeting. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that format. Uh, whilst I will ask you to mute your sound for the time being, if you can, it would be great if you could turn your cameras on uh, it's really nice to be able to put a name to the face uh, and keep this as, as interactive as possible. Mm. Um, if you do have any questions or comments at any time, we would strongly encourage that. Um, just post any questions that you've got in uh, the Q&A function, which is just at the bottom of your uh, Zoom format. Uh, failing that, please do raise your hand uh, and I'll be able to flag that to uh, our moderator, Nard. We may ask you to, uh, to, to give your question uh, out live uh, and, and turn your camera on as well. Really is the best way to get the most out of this session if you guys can contribute. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to uh, your moderator for, the, for today. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Nard Clabbers. Nard uh, worked for, has worked for the food industry for more than a decade now uh, as a liaison between marketing and science. Uh, in 2011, he joined uh, the Dutch research organization TNO to lead the nutrition and health topic. Uh, and also at TNO, he then set up the world's largest public-private research consortium on personalized nutrition and health. His current position is Chief Science Officer for the startup company HAP, uh, and HAP helps com consumers choose and buy better foods based on their personal profile. So, Nard, a very warm welcome, uh, and over to you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Um, always good to hear that introduction. I, I may add that this consortium is not only the biggest, but only the only one, but still, you know, it's always better to call it the, the biggest consortium then. Very pleased to uh, be part of this uh, panel. Uh, very pleased to <coughs> see everyone online and to have this uh, interaction. It would, of course, be better uh, live, but I think this is a very good, uh, very good second. So as Matthew said, uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, I see the chat here, so you can post them in the chat, but uh, the interaction is nicer if you just raise your hand and ask the questions live. We will have about 50 minutes uh, for our discussion. Um, and uh, we will start with a short introductory round. So I was just introduced by Matthew, it's very short also about the company I work for now, which is Hub, which is a company where uh, people can go to with their personal profile, with their personal data, to get personalized nutrition advice across different channels. So no need to have an app for the retailer, an app for the restaurant, and an app for the gym. One place where you can combine all of that in one platform, basically. So that's, you know, to give a idea of where I'm coming from when I'm talking about uh, personal nutrition, I, I strongly believe in bringing a lot of industries, a lot of uh, data together. So to start off, I would like the uh, three panelists. So Lee Siegel, James Bawley and uh, Ahmed uh, El Sahemi from Nutrigenomics to introduce themselves and their companies shortly. Because today we will not only talk, let's say, in general about personalized nutrition, but rather specifically also about you know, what kind of business models are, uh, let's say, available, are presently used in personalized nutrition and will be used towards the future. I'll ask them to introduce themselves, but also shortly introduce their respective businesses. Lee, can I start with you? Sure. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Lihi Siegel. I am founder and CEO of Day2. We were founded in 2015. Uh, we are a precision nutrition, uh, as we call it, a solution. We offer a sustainable path for remission of metabolic disease. Uh, we use gut microbiome sequencing, artificial intelligence, and virtual care to really make an effect on metabolic disease, which includes diabetes, prediabetes, clinical obesity, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
Um, and as I mentioned, what we do is we use a gut microbiome profile, which is based on the stool sample, uh, blood uh, tests, additional information that we collect about the person. And then we use our uh, proprietary blood sugar prediction algorithm, which we call IDA today. And we generate food recommendations, or if you want a food prescription, because this is really food as medicine uh, for each patient. And what we see when we match the right food for each person, we balance blood sugar levels and we get improvements in A1C and time and range and energy, sleep, hunger, everything you can imagine when you're balancing blood sugar levels. Uh, the business model is um, selling uh, on a B2B to C basis. So we sell to payers and employers, uh, mainly in the US market. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then uh, James, can I ask you to uh, shortly introduce yourself and the uh, very interesting company that you're working for now? Sure, thanks, Nard. Uh, pleasure, appreciate it. Uh, so my name is, is James Borley, really happy to be on the panel today. Uh, I am leading our personalized nutrition business at DSM Nutritional Products. Uh, we have spent the last three years basically uh, assembling the various capabilities required for a successful personalized nutrition concept. And personalized nutrition and precision nutrition are a clear strategic focus for, for DSM. And this has now culminated most recently in us launching a dedicated entity based out of Boston, Massachusetts called Hologram Sciences, which is basically um, an entrepreneurial startup entity that will uh, devote its time to developing consumer facing personalized nutrition brands, taking them out direct to consumer and effectively incubating those brands on behalf of DSM's wider uh, B2B customer base. And yeah, look, look forward to digging into that into more detail as we, as we go forward. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Then uh, last but not least, uh, Ahmed El Sahemi. So already a, a, a um, how do you say that in, uh, in English, uh, an, an entrepreneur for quite some time with this company in the uh, nutrigenomics, but also very much uh, involved in uh, personalized nutrition research as a professor in um, the University of Ahmed, can you? Right, thank you, Nard. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's a great pleasure as well to uh, have been invited to participate in this panel. Uh, so as Nard mentioned, I am the founder and uh, serve as uh, CSO of Nutrigenomics. Uh, but I'm also a professor at the University of Toronto uh, in Canada, uh, where I've been doing research in the field of personalized nutrition and nutritional genomics for just over 20 years now. Uh, our company, Nutrigenomics, uh, spelled with an X, was established in 2011. So it's our 10-year anniversary. Uh, so we're happy to have just survived this long. It's uh, been quite a challenging field, and uh, we've seen many companies come and go in the past 10 years. Our focus is on genetic testing. So using a simple non-invasive uh, cheek swab or saliva sample, uh, we provide personalized nutrition recommendations based on the science. So for us and myself as being an academic, science comes first before anything. Uh, so our business model is through healthcare professionals. So we're not direct to consumer, our service is only available through uh, nutrition professionals. We currently have in 40 countries. Uh, our reports are available in eight different languages and we continue to expand into different markets. And uh, we're all about personalization. So it's important for us to take into account local cultures and customs and cuisines in terms of providing personalized advice. Uh, the major source is in Brazil or North America or Europe. And so uh, because we're all about personal fertility, also for sports and athletic performance, 
Uh, and most recently, we developed the very first personalized nutrition test for plant-based eating for those who are vegans or vegetarians who want to make sure that they get adequate nutrients based on their uh, food preferences. Okay, thank you, Robert. Robert, your connection was a little bit dodgy, so you froze uh, for a second there, but I think it was still uh, understandable. I'm not sure if you can do anything about it. Usually not, but just so you know. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's really great to have uh, these uh, three uh, companies and already also companies uh, like Day2 Nutrigenomics that have proven themselves, I think, in the market. So um, we were just... You know, before we started, I was uh, reminiscing a little bit with uh, Lee about the first time we met way back in, in Amsterdam, in, in really in the beginning days of, uh, of day two, which actually started after a, a really groundbreaking uh, uh, scientific paper also from the Whiteman Institute. And Lee, can you, can you explain a little bit from that period to where you are now? Because from my uh, perspective, you did... Uh, change a little bit in the target audience and in the business model that you had, let's say the vision that you had in the very beginning. And now, can you can you share a little bit on that? Sure, uh, and thank you for uh, emphasizing that we are a very scientific based company. Uh, we did stem out of the Weizmann Institute, the two professors, Professor Ron Siegel and Professor Ron Alinav. Uh, who really for the first time, I think, decided to take a different look at nutrition. And I think uh, compared to where, you know, they came up with the notion at that point that we should stop looking at the food and start looking at the person. And the whole gut microbiome field is really where they pioneered uh, a very, very groundbreaking um, technology that we licensed. And we were starting to uh, base, as you said, in the really beginning. Uh, so in terms of our business models, we kicked off in Israel first. Um, and what we loved about uh, the whole area in the field of the precision nutrition as we were uh, pioneering it, it was really based on data, big data and an algorithm. So the whole field of the gut microbiome is relatively new, still is new, even though we know a lot more. Uh, but we used it in a way that it's an algorithm. It's a predictive algorithm. We were uh, staying away from trying to explain exactly how it works, why this bacteria or this gene in the bacteria is actually affecting blood sugar levels. It was really picking up signals uh, in what we call the black box. And so it made the commercialization and the business model immediate, right? Within a year, we had a product. Uh, it didn't, uh, we didn't need like seven years or 10 years of uh, research for that. Um, and we started off in a very easy way, just going to consumers, uh, putting the product out. The product was taking a stool sample, running it all that data through the algorithm, and then having a mobile app, which we, of course, are still, uh, it's a very core uh, aspect of our solution. Uh, we have a database in the US with over millions of foods and brands and restaurants in Israel. It's a little bit less than that. And we really just went out there and selling directly to consumers. Uh, who were, um, you know, we have, um, you know, I don't know, close to 100,000 people on the program today across Israel and the US. Uh, it, it really helped people balance their blood sugar levels. And I think this is also where we had a differentiator compared to many other companies, because we are not just saying this is healthy for you. We are saying you can really have an outcome that you can measure. Uh, but our goal was always to uh, put this as part of the total care of the person. So both in Israel and in the US, uh, we are part of the HMOs in Israel. So we have Khalit, which is the largest uh, HMO in Israel, and soon Maccabi, which is the second largest, offering this to their members, subsidizing it both for healthy people and also people with prediabetes and diabetes. Uh, because they're all about prevention. Uh, but just approaching consumers to us was not, um, was really just like taking a sliver of the population without bringing in the doctors and the caretakers. Uh, and that's where we decided really to take the focus on B2B when we could, right? So you start off with the proof points and you start with real world evidence and then you move forward that way. And in the US, it's really focused on metabolic disease. We see people reduce medications. We see people who are in remission of their diabetes. 
And it's a very costly disease. So if you want and you follow the money and who's paying for diabetes care and metabolic disease care, it only makes sense to go into those employers and payers in order to turn this into a very robust solution that actually changes people's lives. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that, that, that's also the, let's say, from a little bit more distance, first going to consumers trying to prove basically the, 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 the valor of, of, of the whole proposition. And then basically with approval, so going to, let's say, the larger corporations to see, you know, how can they save money using this, right? And then building. Your right. That's it. That. But yeah, that's exactly true. And it's not to say that we do not believe in the consumer markets. As a startup, we yeah. had to choose. We are now allowing through an API other companies which are focused on consumer markets and the large food companies and, you know, where's DSM, right? Uh, a potential collaboration with companies like DSM, for example, not that we have that now, but as an example, uh, we really viewed ourselves as the center of, we know personalized nutrition and we know it well, again, in the aspects of controlling blood sugar levels. Yeah. And so the collaborations to your partner that you want the ecosystem to collaborate together, that is definitely something that we can expose to others to use in markets that we are not playing in directly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. I'll, I'll, I will ask you about, let's say, sure. your progression towards a future business model in a minute. Exactly. Because I wanted to take basically one of the important things that you said to, to James, and that is the uh, ability to actually measure the effects Right? Because I think that that's also one of the key aspects of, let's say, the new hologram sciences business proposition, basically, to have a proof of concept in the market that people actually also measure the health effects and then build this, this uh, 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 product market combination also upon that. So James, can you explain a little bit more in, in a little bit more detail what, what hologram is going to do and perhaps share also one of the examples of the new product? Because I think it really is a very interesting yeah. proposition. Yeah, with pleasure. And I, I think that whole topic of measurement and being able to track and understand as an individual understanding your sort of your starting point and your and your progress, that was something that we actually, um, that was kind of almost a starting point for us a few years back. Uh, I was leading the dietary supplement segment at the time for DSM nutritional products. And the, the consumer insights were telling us that actually, you know, consumers were extremely um, you know, at best mistrustful and or at least rather confused about what they really required and what benefits they could expect to experience and this, you know, struggling with how to approach, um, you know, their nutrition and, and, and specifically supplementing their nutrition for a particular outcome. And at that time also, you, you started to see a lot more um, emerging technologies in make, that, that make it ever easier for a, a person to, to self-assess their nutritional status, for example, at home, right? Or as Ahmed said, you know, you know democratizing the DNA sampling, it's, it's become so much more accessible. So that was really the starting point. We said, yes, let's assemble those capabilities, starting with the ability to measure. Um, that was kind of the first point. Then the second point was, okay, alongside being able to measure, we also need to be able to interact with the co consumer to help them understand that measurement, uh, make a recommendation against it, and then help them follow and track their progress, right? So that was then the digital component. And we made an acquisition in November to basically acquire that digital backbone, a company called Ava, uh, who were also based out of the US. And then the, the, third part, the, the third part of the jigsaw was really um, being able to then deliver the nutritional products uh, based on the assessment and based on the recommendations. And there also, uh, we had a, a pretty, uh, cast a pretty wide net in terms of venturing uh, opportunities and identifying partners. And I see some of them are on the call, partners like Panasutics, who specialize in delivering customized food pouches uh, against a personalized recipe that, that the data is, is recommending. So we, we, we gathered all these um, together. And in terms of how we then deploy those, that seemed quite, there we've seen quite an evolution also in our own strategy. We started out very much in the sense of wanting to collaborate, 
um, a collaborative process with our, our B2B customers, typically big brand owners. And what we collectively quickly realized is that um, as big corporations, we were all super committed and excited uh, about personalized nutrition. Uh, and yet we also struggled, perhaps because of the size, you know, frankly, it was sometimes a struggle to deploy these quite new business models and, and tying together these new capabilities to deploy those in, in the market was quite difficult. So, you know, also based on our customer feedback, we then took the decision, you know what, let's rather take um, the approach where, where um, we construct a personalized nutrition brand with those three elements. And we rather like, not, not dissimilar to what Leahy was saying, we actually take that direct to the consumer and we test it with those consumers and, and demonstrate basically commercial viability, traction, validate the science um, as part of that process. Uh, and, and to do that as, as basically a consumer facing company and, and to be able to do that in an agile and rapid way, we figured that the best chance of success there was really to, to initiate our own startup, personalized nutrition startup, if you will, in the form of, of hologram sciences, which is obviously uh, has the luxury of being supported financially by DSM and also um, as part of the DSM family, being able to draw on DSM resources when it comes to in innovation. And so those hologram sciences, consumer brands, we've just launched one um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, a brand called Develop. You may have seen uh, press releases around that. And that's um, obviously in the current, current situation, that's focusing on immunity. Um, more specifically, it's focusing on enabling people to assess their own vitamin D levels, scientifically well-recognized to be critical for good immunity, um, even potentially uh, being able to to uh, support your immunity during challenges like COVID. Um, so the develop concept basically equips you with a, an in-home vitamin D test, very easy to do. Uh, a digital companion that gives you advice and recommendations based on your test results and based on lifestyle factors. And then should you require a boost in your vitamin levels uh, also enables you to purchase a, a, a um, fast absorbable vitamin D supplement. So those three elements, again, they all join together in this finished concept, and that's now being taken directly to the consumer um, to basically pilot the concept. Yeah, indeed. So, and, and when it is successful, you are looking for companies basically to take over that whole package, right? That whole product market combination, basically. Yeah, that's that's a good summary, Nart. I think it's, um, you know, that, that there is always going to be optionality in what happens to these pilot brands, if you like, as they mature. And one of those will always be, um, to, you know, they, they will become accessible to our, uh, to the DSM customer base in some way, shape or form. That could be through licensing or partnering, for example. Yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing all of the trials and errors and also the mistakes that you're going to make, of course, because that's what <laughs> that teaches you. a lot. Uh, we, uh, so. I, I, I'm humble and, uh, and yes, that is also part, actually, it's interesting, it's part of the, it's part of the philosophy is also we know that, you know, we want to launch several of these concepts every year. We know that they're not, not necessarily all going to be resounding successes, right? There is yeah. an element of learning and trial and error that we've allowed for in this strategy. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So Pleasure. talking about learning, and that's a question I want to ask uh, Ahmed, because he is, let's say, uh, from uh, all of us here on the table, definitely the, the most... Um, experienced, I would say, you know, with 10 years of, of his own business in, in, in personalized nutrition and 20 years of research. So Ahmed, if you take yourself back to, let's say, 10 years ago, and the ideas you had on the business model, on the product, on your business, basically, and where you are now, can, can you take us through that journey? What I mean, is it what you expected? What went differently? Sure. I mean, I think when I, when I go back and uh, consider you know, part of the motivation for establishing the company, uh, it really came from the idea of trying to uh, restore credibility to the field. Because if you recall, back then, just over, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, there were some, you know, it was a bit of a wild west. Uh, and there were some early providers that were making some claims that were not necessarily established in science. Uh, and because, 
you know, we are submitting grant applications to funding agencies, uh, that kind of negative publicity uh, was, was impacting the research. Uh, so we decided, well, let's try to do this properly. Uh, and our approach was to offer a test that was available only through healthcare professionals. So registered dietitians, physicians, uh, naturopaths, and other nutrition professionals. Uh, because our view was, you know, we don't want to just rely on, you know, fancy and glitzy marketing and try to sell something online to as many people as possible. We want them to go to their trusted healthcare professional. So if your dietitian, if your physician vouches for this test and says, yes, you know what, this is actually based on science, then there's more likely to have uptake and uh, it's more likely to stick with them. Uh, and so, even though in the initial days, perhaps that was a slower growth, uh, we're quite happy that this was the approach that we took, uh, as opposed to just trying to, you know, sell as many as we can directly to consumers. Uh, so the science over the past 10 years has certainly evolved uh, quite tremendously. Uh, back then, when we first uh, you know, uh, established or developed a test, we had only seven genetic markers. Uh, and some looked at it and said, oh, you know what? There's been other companies that offer thousands of genetic markers. Well, more is not necessarily better. We know the science and there just are not a thousand recommendations that one could make based on genetic tests. So we've tried to stay true to the science uh, some have asked us about developing a test for low fat versus low carb. Uh, and we said, you know, as much as we'd like to, and as much as we know that some people do respond better to a low fat diet versus a low carb diet when it comes to weight loss, there currently are no genetic markers to support that. Uh, and if you may recall, a couple of years ago, uh, this diet fit study out of Stanford showed just that, that people, some people do respond better to low fat versus low carb. Uh, but the genetic markers that they looked at are not enough to, uh, they don't enable us to, to predict that kind of response. So the other issue I think that we've seen over the years is issues around uh, privacy and, and confidentiality and sensitivity of personal information. And of course, nothing is more personal than one's DNA and their genetic makeup. So from day one, uh, we've gone to extreme measures to anonymize samples. Uh, so because we don't work directly with consumers, we just get samples with a barcode. Uh, we don't know who that sample belongs to, only the healthcare practitioner does. So we feel that that approach has really um, uh, gained the trust of consumers because they're really working with their healthcare professional and their genetic report is treated with the same kind of privacy and confidentiality that any of their health information uh, is treated. So even though it was kind of slow in terms of initial days of growth, we think that that's really kind of picked up uh, over the years, uh, especially since we've established partnerships with organizations like the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and so we're their exclusive provider of genetic testing. And when other clinics and other practitioners see that uh, reputable organizations like the Cleveland Clinic are offering our test, they're more likely to, uh, to inquire and want to learn more about our test and our training. So um, it's been uh, quite an interesting journey, but uh, that's kind of what- But also what I understand from you, is it's, it, it, it is quite a, a straight line from what you started with to where you're now, right? I mean, the vision and the, the real product hasn't changed that much, has it? Right. I mean, in terms of uh, the uh, development of our product, um, oh, as I mentioned about 10 years ago, we had only seven genetic sure. markers. Uh, today, we have over 70. Uh, and so the, the product has evolved over time, just as the science has evolved. Yeah, of course. But I mean, the product is still the same. I mean, it's now, it, it, it is 10 times better, of course, but it's still the same uh, product that, let's say, based on your genes, you get the recommendations that are based in science and your healthcare practitioner helps you to implement what you have learned from your genes, basically. Right. And the, the basic essence of it is certainly around the genetics, but we have expanded the nature of the product. So for example, a couple of years ago, we established a partnership with BioCare to incorporate a dietary assessment component. 
Uh, and so our view is you can't tell someone to change what they're eating without knowing what they're eating. So that was a new aspect to the service that we incorporated. Uh, we also started incorporating DNA-based uh, meal plans. So rather than just giving recommendations on different nutrients, we now offer complete meal plans. People want to know, okay, okay, what, what, you know, what do I need to eat now based on these recommendations? So yeah. in that respect, the, uh, the service has evolved to incorporate these other complementary services. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a question uh, in the chat, and because obviously we want to uh, uh, reward people asking questions. So I will just read out the question. Uh, so the science has evolved for sure, but the regulations haven't, especially in the US. So how do you find the balance between developing nutrition-based diet or supplement solutions versus diagnostic medical devices? Uh, so the balance between nutrition-based solutions versus, versus diagnostic medical devices, does that influence how you approach the science and the final product offering? Is there someone of the three that wants to uh, answer this? I'd be happy to start. I mean, um, that's a great, it's a great question. And absolutely, um, it, it's from a regulatory standpoint, uh, not only from, you know, country to country, uh, but even within the United States, there are different uh, regulations from state to state. Uh, New York State, for example, their requirements are different from other states. Uh, some states require written informed consent for a genetic test. So even though it's not a diagnostic. So we definitely went through uh, a lot of uh, learning in the early days to understand the regulatory landscape. Uh, in fact, we're about to publish a paper that looks at the, reg the global regulatory landscape of consumer genetic testing. Uh, and so when it comes to a genetic test for personalized nutrition, even though it is a genetic test, it's ultimately nutrition advice. So the, it's not a diagnostic, and it's not classified as a diagnostic. So uh, we are able to kind of get just below the radar in terms of FDA's regulations for uh, genetic testing for diagnostic purposes. But it's definitely an area that's important to uh, consider, uh, to continue to monitor uh, because as you may know, uh, the FDA had a number of exchanges with 23andMe, one of the earlier providers of uh, genetic testing, not, not specifically for nutrition, but in general, ancestry, lifestyle, and, and other attributes. Uh, so these are things that do continue to change over the years, and I think it's important for companies to uh, you know, have their finger on the pulse in terms of how that's changing. Lee, how is that for day two? I mean, uh, for you, for you, it must also be an issue. Yeah, well, it's uh, in in um, in the earlier days, we did go through an assessment on the legal and you know requirements and what uh, we need to do. We do have a kit that's getting sent home uh, as well. So in certain states, there are certain uh, restrictions, like New York or Maryland or Massachusetts, that have different uh, regulations. We need to of course, abide by them. Uh, and so we definitely took that into consideration and we're also considering what we're saying and what we're not and we're not diagnostics and this is not a treatment. Um, so we worked around it. Uh, privacy issues are of course a very big thing. The company is HIPAA compliant, you know, 27,001 uh, uh, standard ISO certification, SOC2. We went through all of that in order to be able to sell to payers and employers and the large organizations in the US, you have to be able to go through a very rigid uh, privacy and security assessments in order to even partner with uh, uh, someone uh, like that. And so we did invest a lot of engineering efforts to be able to be compliant in those aspects as well. Yeah, absolutely. James, do you have anything to, uh, to, to add to this also from... Uh... No, I mean, I would just echo what um, Lee and Ahmed said. I, I really like Ahmed's point also on the, the, the role for a you know, qualified healthcare practitioner or, or uh, you know, nutritionist or, or qualified dietitian in that loop. Um, we, we, we use that uh, in our approach as well. It is a complex area to, to navigate. I like um, also the, the sentiment that we stay away from, from disease diagnosis, absolutely. Uh, this really is about, um, you know, lifestyle and dietary recommendations. Uh, and if those can be channeled through a healthcare practitioner as, you know, for example, in our, in our digital coaching platform, 
we have um, access to qualified healthcare practitioners that can contrib contribute and provide guidance. Um, I think we, yeah, we have to try and, and, and I see that in, in all three of the panelists, we really try to take the high road um, in the absence of um, a really clear regulatory framework. And, and I totally agree in the, in the US, it, it is extremely complex. In fact, Nard, you probably know that better than me, but from memory, I, I think South Korea is almost unique in having a, like a, a regulatory framework specifically for personalized nutrition um, and most countries in the world are, are really lagging behind on that. Uh, Absolutely. So, it's, it's so it, it is, to look for. yeah. So I'm actually, so uh, one of the, uh, I'm still very active, let's say, in, in the personalized nutrition world, even though I, I left the research organization, to you know. So I'm actually uh, uh, organizing, uh, writing of a position paper on, on personalized nutrition to kind of um, streamline the consensus around personalized nutrition. And this aspect, let's say, on what is the regulatory framework for personalized nutrition globally is just non-existent basically. And it means also that the, the discussion around personalized nutrition, whether it be with a uh, governmental body or an investor or a large corporate or healthcare practitioner, it kind of always needs a lot of explanation. So what are we talking about then, right? And that's because there is no, let's say, defined framework not only for the regulatory requirements let's say for personalized nutrition but also for the legal or for let's say the scientific requirements of personalized nutrition i mean there are many definitions of personalized nutrition but the real consensus yeah. of what it is is definitely different and also different around the globe I mean, is, is it yeah. something that, that you as i see lee agree yeah no i i i wanted to um i wanted to talk a little bit about i mean there's the, the whole we, we see the personalized nutrition all over clearly and touching into your point i think um that a lot of them for the consumers or for the users never mind how you sell at the end of the day even for us there's always a c there that we're always looking at the member we're also looking to see right how they are interacting with the program and with their dietitians or but it's all to us, it's all about outcomes. It's all about how do we know that what we are um, uh, you know, prescribing or recommending to you is actually working. We see, um, and, and to us, it was always a very, very important point. Measurable outcomes that everybody can look at and see. And what are those, right? How, and, and I'm, I'm saying this on day two, but I see many other companies, not the ones on the panel clearly, but other companies who are uh, really just putting statements out there. They're taking our cell paper and they have shiny products and they're adding supplements on it without any signs whatsoever. And uh, you know they're coming to us with questions and we're like, show us the signs, just show us the signs or show, or show us the outcomes. And so I think what you're trying to do Nard is, is kind of talk about that aspect as well. Uh, how do we standardize what the what is the benchmark? What is the standard for seeing that something actually works? And what is the scientific rigor that you have to do that? For us, and when you're measuring blood sugar levels, you put a continuous glucose monitor, you see time and range go down, you see medications go down, you see weight go down. It's there's no like uh, oh, we think it's working. It is real concrete evidence that you see in claims data and uh, and, 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 right, and clinical metrics that we're following. Uh, but I think we're like up here and everybody else or a lot of the other players in the market are just like talking about this and adding stuff and probiotics and I'm not seeing the evidence. I'm not seeing the scientific yeah. rigor. So maybe that would be a really good way to help uh, the consumers. Absolutely. So that is actually one of the- uh, What's one of working the... and what's not. Yeah, this is absolutely one of the objectives of, of, of that position paper. If people want to know more, please contact me online, et cetera. But to, to have that kind of consensus state, the need of what is personalized yeah. nutrition? When can we call it personalized nutrition? Can we call it personalized nutrition if we change the name from NARC to Ahmed? And is that personalization? You know, is it personalization yeah. if, we, if we adapt it to your taste or does it need to have, let's say, a health benefit? How rigorous would that uh, proof need to be, et cetera? I mean, so that's really, I think, an important discussion for the whole industry to get us, let's say, up until, let's say, a certain level from which we can talk about personalized nutrition. Yeah, so well, I was I'd love about, to yeah. participate in that. Well, you're right. invited. Uh, <laughs> for so, Ahmed, I was, I, I was thinking about basically these, these measurable effects, because, I mean, one of the things that I, I've, I'm always saying about, about DNA, so, you know, we all like DNA, 
but one thing you know for sure, it will never change, right? So you can give the advice. So how do you take, uh, um, how, how do you measure the effect? How, how do you see if, if what you say works? Because you can say it works because I've seen it in the science. This is the best advice for you. But then of course, people need to use that advice. So, so how do you approach that proof basically of what of that what you are doing and saying actually works and in, uh, in your client? Yep, great question, and uh, one that we started asking a number of years ago. You know, what happens when you give people genetic information? Uh, so we decided to put it to the test and using the gold standard randomized controlled clinical trial. We compared those who were given DNA-based dietary advice uh, versus those who were given standard advice. And then we followed them up uh, up to one year later and found that those who got the DNA-based dietary advice, they actually followed the recommendations to a uh, greater extent than those who were in the uh, uh, control group. Uh, that was the first study of its kind, but since the uh, phenomenon, uh, in fact, uh, enough studies uh, such that there has been now a, a systematic review that was published just a few months ago, uh, showing that all of these studies now demonstrate conclusively that giving people DNA-based dietary advice is more effective uh, in terms of dietary change. Now, the next question, of course, is, okay, they changed their diet. Well, does that actually translate into clinically measurable outcomes? Uh, there was a study that was just published again uh, last year showing that, yes, indeed, in terms of body composition, those who followed the advice uh, on top of the gold standard diabetes prevention program uh, or group lifestyle balance, as it's called now, they actually showed greater improvements in um, adiposity. So they actually lost more body fat after three months and again after, uh, after six months. So it's been shown, again, using the gold standard RCT, that, um, that a simple genetic test coupled with simple dietary advice does lead to meaningful changes to eating habits and to measurable uh, outcomes like body composition. Yeah. Thank you. I always like your, your answers being very uh, scientific and always, you know, with uh, the literature uh, included. Ahmed. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> so I have a, a specific question for you also, Ahmed, which is from the audience. Uh, how do you see the future of nutrigenomics versus nutri-epigenomics uh, over, let's say, the next uh, 10 years? So genomics, oh, epige a... epigenomics. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Manfred. I actually started <laughs> typing in a, a response to that question. I might post it on the chat anyways, just so you can have it written there. Um, but basically, my answer is that um, epigenetics is, of course, very important for us to understand the molecular mechanisms of action. But as you know, epigenetic changes uh, are tissue-specific. So what happens in the small intestine is not the same as the epigenetic uh, profile in the muscle or adipose or any other tissue. So from a, from a research perspective, it's a very valuable tool to understand how nutrients impact health outcomes. But from a commercialization perspective, it's not very practical because we're not going to be taking uh, biopsies of you know, tissues and sending them in to understand what our epigenetic profile looks like. And a, a clear example of how simple non-invasive genetics is uh, a better measure of response to nutrition than, than epigenetic information uh, is lactose intolerance. So we're all born with a particular version of the lactase gene, and we either have lactose intolerance or we don't. However, that doesn't manifest until late childhood. So until a child reaches about eight, nine, or 10 years old, even though they were born with that gene. But what happens is that there's an age-associated epigenetic modification. So those who have a particular genotype, uh, as they age, it, that gene gets silenced and they're no longer able to produce enough lactase. 
Whereas those who don't have that genotype and don't have lactose intolerant, they're able to continue to produce it. So that's an epigenetic modification that happens to the lactase gene in the small intestine. So rather than taking a biopsy of a person's intestine to find out if they have you know, lactose intolerance, they can actually just do a non-invasive saliva test. So the short answer also, is to, to a make lot it, of interest to make in it even, epigenetic. Yeah, to, to make it even more uh, complex is that also if people continue drinking milk, then the lactase activity remains higher than if they don't drink milk. So there's also, let's say, a diet interaction, of course. Sure. And in fact, it actually goes now to uh, what uh, Leahy's working on, which is the microbiome. Because as you say, uh, gradually increasing your lactose uh, consumption, even if you have lactose intolerance, does lead to a shift in the microbiome. Uh, so this is where really there's complementarity between the host genome and the gut microbiome. Uh, it's not kind of one or the other, they work in concert. Uh, and so you can shift the type of bacteria to metabolize lactose rather than ferment it, which is what causes, you know, the undesirable side effects. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, yeah. I'd love, I see just in the chat, there's a really good question about the public, um, the public health guidelines. Um, and I'm assuming everybody can read this and it goes back down to what you just said on on the microbiome, and of course, a lot of the research in the company is is done on our, you know, tens of thousands of uh, of uh, microbiome samples that we have, and uh, we're able to take that into much more advanced solutions that we're working on. But I did want to say, on the one size fits all, everybody understand there's no one size fits all nutrition anymore. Uh, we have seen the NIH in the U.S. recently launch uh, a ten year a research study investing, you know, um, hundreds and of millions of dollars into understanding precision nutrition specifically. Many of the parties were brought to the table. It is based on the cell paper. It is based and quoted and uh, featured on the cell paper of the Weizmann Institute. And they are definitely looking at this now and trying to take it into the next level and understanding how over the course of 10 years, the science will deepen into it and into how they can implement this across uh, the United States as recommendations that will really get into the public health uh, care as well. Yeah. And also perhaps to, uh, to add to this, so, uh, so I, I've had the discussion and the question uh, quite often, you know, how you can basically marry the whole concept of personalized nutrition with uh, nutritional guidelines, which are population-based. And usually, let's say for 95% of the cases, perhaps, personalization uh, can definitely happen within the, uh, uh, guide, uh, let's say, the, the uh, guidelines for uh, uh, public health. I mean, there are not that many uh, people that really need very extreme diets. So it's not, let's say, the uh, contradiction that it sometimes seems. The, the level of yeah. precision that is required, I think, is different. But uh, James, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's actually a really good point. The level of precision that's required is different, but um, also echoing your point, Nard. Yeah, I think at least in the case of micronutrient monitoring, so monitoring the levels of, say, vitamins uh, against uh, an, you know an optimal level, you know that's something where you we can still work within existing guidelines. Uh, clearly, those guidelines are historical, so there is room for those to evolve as well. And and I think the approaches will evolve in parallel, but you know, coming back to the vitamin D example, uh, you know, we would not we would not advise against you know we would not advise overdosing on, on vitamin D. I think you can do a lot of good um, even just staying within the current guidelines. Right? I mean, again, many many people even struggle to to hit the the, the right levels based on the current guidelines, let alone future guidelines. So. There's, there's quite a bit of room for maneuver there. Um, for other conditions, if you, if you start to move into really outcome-based um, conditions like diabetes or pre-diabetes, um, yeah, Lee, I, I totally agree. You need to validate that clinically, whatever your intervention and your, and your diagnostic and your recommendation and coaching is, uh, that all needs to be, um, yeah, really needs to be locked down before, before you would take that to, to, to the consumer. 
Absolutely. So there um, is one. Oh, sorry. No, no. I, I think what we didn't discuss, Nard, until now, and all these solutions, uh, sometimes the level of change people have to go through in the way they eat and in their diets is significant. Mm. And we found in day two that that, um, that is a really big barrier. People tried, so if yeah. you take a keto diet, which is a one size fits all, but it's still a keto diet. It's a, you know, effective for blood sugar, uh, but it's really eliminating whole groups of food. Like you can't eat carbs or very little carbs. And, we found, uh, and I think that the, all the research shows and real life shows that people can do it, but only for so long. And I really think that the big, and, I, and I'm and it's in James and I mean, you're, you're there as well. When we're allowing people to eat differently or when we're recommending people to eat differently, you have to meet them where they are. Yeah, yeah, totally. uh, day two is, is super successful in the engagement and the compliance just because of that, because we allow people to eat yeah. carbs, but we find the right combinations. We take people in very small steps. And, and thankfully we found in the data that it supports it. But when somebody, I don't know, needs vitamin D and now, well, supplements of course help that because then you don't have to really change what you're eating necessarily. But trying to take people 180 degrees from yeah, where exactly. they are and where they live and some of them don't have access to that food and continue to eat food that maybe is not considered healthy, but for blood sugar, you're trying to take them into a better place. I'm just wondering how others have, have uh, looked at that uh, aspect as well. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it yeah. is, if I may, may react also. I'm sorry, for hijacking no, it is no, 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 it is definitely one of my hobby horses to ride that, that personalized nutrition basically is consumer empowerment and behavioral change. Right? So that if people do not change their behavior, all of the best advice that, mm. you know, is basically given to those people you know based on dna and based on gen genetics whatever you, know, you can give them the advice but if you don't change their behavior there's there's nothing there's no effect right so i mean and basically this behavioral change and rewarding people and taking people along let's say on a journey with small steps with the rewards along the time etc i mean that is definitely important i i, I have sometimes called it the uh tech trap of personalized nutrition that you think if we just give the best personalized nutrition advice based on metabolomics yeah. and based on all the measurements etc mm -hmm. then people will follow it and that is true for a very small percentage of people yeah like exactly. athletes right or, or for uh, a short right. time or yeah. for a short time but for yeah. large groups of people you definitely need this extra layer of personalization not only on biology but also on psychology and on social sociology. Yeah. So really in, integrating it into your life. So I think it's a very, very good point. Yeah. And so I, we found that if you don't have that program, if yeah. you yes. don't take people and you don't follow them with a coach and a guide. Yeah, exactly. And then the essence of the recommendation is easy to live with because you're just telling them it's the same food, just switch this, switch this out. Yeah. It goes a long way. And so... That is a really good recommendation. Add to that too, I think some, uh, uh, I mean, the whole field is not without its critics and skeptics. And there are people who think, you know, personalized nutrition is elitist uh, and, mm. you know, genetic testing is not available for everyone or any other kind of, uh, of test. Uh, and they claim that, you know, we're saying that uh, personalized nutrition is going to revolutionize things. But I think it's important for us to recognize that it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. And it's about nudging people to yeah. make these small, meaningful, and as Lee, he mentioned, sustainable uh, changes, because right. those small dietary changes do have meaningful effects on health outcomes over the years, right? I mean, nutrition is not like a drug where it has a, a massive immediate effect. Uh, it's all about sustainable improvements to your diet yeah totally agree absolutely i think the the revolution will be in the skill and the optimization not so much in the time uh, yeah. dietitian I've, I've done so i have to uh think um we, there are some questions still um we, we kind of we're kind, kind of running out of time Matthew, how out. much time do we still have it's like, like five yeah, minutes we can go another five minutes for sure yeah, yeah. okay so there's one great question oh, oh, oh. I have to scroll. There were some questions around public health and how that... Uh, mm. Yeah, so public health, I think we, we kind of discussed already a little bit. There's one a rather specific question from, from Claire Stewart. What can we learn from screening exosomes for nutritional interventions versus serum profiles or buckle swaps? And how we can make relevant intervention for all, particularly those in the lowest uh, economic de de demographics. So this is... 
Yeah. Is that, is that my, it's a good question. <laughs> I can talk about the microbiome here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think here also what 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 is important is to to use that. So if if I may answer to use the information from that in a sensible program mm -hmm. basically to change people's behavior. I, I, I think that is also towards the lowest, uh, the lowest sex, the lowest socioeconomic status groups. I think that is definitely the-, the Well, that's answer. right. I mean, and, and indeed, I mean, also you triggered me, you know, the, the sometimes the outside perception is that this is elitist, but it doesn't need to be, does it? I think, you know, DNA testing is a great example. It used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now it's much more accessible over time. Um, these assessment tools will become more and more uh, accessible also down, down at lower prices. Um, and, and sometimes you don't even need a, a sophisticated diagnostic, right? You can do a lot of good by interacting with someone digitally and just learning about their natural, their, their current lifestyle, you know, um, a short conversation on, on life, dietary habits and lifestyle is already a great baseline to you know to make some i think some valid interventions uh and and that that can be extremely low cost right yeah. so so this, totally is, this absolutely does not need to be elitist i think on the contrary yeah yeah okay very good so for the very last question um the uh, for all of the panelists a very short question describe can you describe the similarities or differences between the concept of precision medicine versus precision nutrition. Precision nutrition versus precision medicine. So what's the overlap and what's the difference? Yeah, um, so first of all, I think precision medicine today is based on DNA. Uh, most of it is, uh, is the concept of, uh, you know, once the whole uh, genome was sequenced and identified, and then they are trying to um, uh, personalize the treatments. We see this a lot of oncology, uh, and all that is based on on right on taking a treatment and then trying to find out where it's uh, uh, where it applies to certain people and where it doesn't. There's a lot of traction in that field. I personally don't think that the promise is uh, is there yet. I think when we started off uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, with the genome project, we thought that it would bring us into much yeah. different area than what we see in the field. Uh, in the precision nutrition, as I mentioned, the NIH is launching that uh, really 10 uh, year uh, program uh, to try and see where that fits. Um, and there it's, uh, it's adjacent, I would say to this, they are looking into genetics as well as part of that program. And of course, uh, metabolomics and also microbiome. So they are trying to take a very wide look. I think from what I've seen and what I've talked to the people in Washington, it is looking into the omics in general and trying to look at the combination of all that together to look at precision nutrition as part of precision medicine, or as they call it, it's precision nutrition. It's not called personalized nutrition. It's precision Got nutrition it. and precision medicine. Mm -hmm. So the, the areas are converging to, starting to converge from what I've seen. And then there's a whole area on the microbiome side that is precision medicine that's not based on DNA, but on the microbiome, we see people adhering to various programs and to drugs and, and reacting very differently based on there are microbiome profiles in oncology, and these are like various projects that are in works mm -hmm. by the Weizmann scientists and you know scientists all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I mean some some groups just define it uh, you know differently, and and uh, I think some consider precision medicine as being more along the lines of treatment, yeah. uh, whereas precision nutrition has more of an opportunity for prevention. Prevention, yeah. Uh, so I think it's yeah. I mean, uh, that's two good. sides of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a distinction I would always refer to as well. Yeah, yeah and, and then what, what I do see basically also is that there is, let's say, more and more convergence of the two concepts. And you see, right. let's say, the large pharmaceutical companies also more interested in prevention mm -hmm. and also in, as uh, Lee said in her very uh, opening statement, basically the idea of uh, food as medicine. Right, so there's definitely an overlap uh, yeah. there. Uh, so I see uh, other questions coming in. I see someone raising their hand, but it is 
one minute before five. I also had actually a lot of questions uh, <laughs> on my little list here about business models, about opportunities for working together, about the importance of joint innovation for personalized nutrition, but the time has simply run out. Uh, so this, this uh, may be an invitation to do uh, this uh, session again at some point. I would definitely welcome it because I um, have absolutely enjoyed the uh, discussion and also the interaction with the, uh, with the audience. So I want to thank the organizers, Matthew, all of the panelists, but also definitely the audience for making this a uh, very nice uh, one hour of my life. Excellent. Likewise, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Uh, that's thank you, everyone. everyone. Just, a, just a big thank you from us for, for the panelists and, and for Nard and your excellent moderation of that session. Uh, if there are any questions that anyone has that weren't answered, uh, I should point out that our, our panelists uh, will be uh, available on the HealthSpan show uh, partnering system. Uh, so on the swap card system, please feel free to reach out to them with, with a direct message uh, to continue the conversation. We do have a, a lot of content still to go today on, on the HealthSpan show. Uh, it is also available on demand. So feel free to dip in and out of that uh, as we go through the rest of the week. But um, yeah, just to echo Nard's sentiments, thank you to everyone that's um, got involved and been interactive today. And a big thank you again to our, our panelists and moderator. Thank you.